All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining um, in this particular presentation. We're going to talk about active defense and cyber deception and how we can actually start using that effectively um, in conjunction with the MITRE ATT&CK technique matrix for SHIELD and how we can start changing defense so it's actually fun again. Now, one of the big things that I think is absolutely critical for anybody um, whenever you're actually working through cyber deception, and I can't, where's my next slide button? Apparently I don't have a next slide button. If I click on the slide, it doesn't go to the next. There we go, I had to click it like three times. All right, so um, whenever you're looking at cyber deception, a lot of people ask questions about the legality of cyber deception and whether or not you can do it without going to jail. And one of my favorite stories for this is Susan Clements Vet Jeffries versus Absolute Software. And in this particular case, Susan Clements Jeffrey was a substitute teacher. And she was at school one day teaching and a student came up to her and said, hey, would you like to buy us a, a MacBook Pro for $50? She's like, this sounds totally legit. So she bought the MacBook Pro and she literally purchased it at a school bus stop, which I just find absolutely hilarious for some reason. And she bought this computer, immediately took it home and immediately started cyber sexting her boyfriend. Now, the problem for Susan Clements Jeffrey was that notebook was in fact stolen from another school district. That's one problem. The other problem is they had absolute software installed, which is kind of like LoJack for computers. And the authorities and the school district were able to take very multiple pictures of Susan Clements Jeffrey in various states of undress and sexual activity, according from the court documents. Naturally, she wasn't happy about this. She pressed charges. Now, what's interesting is we have two things at kind of odds with each other. We have, it's the school's computer. Clearly, they owned that computer system. And then we have, does Susan Clements Jeffrey have a right to privacy? And it turns out the judge in this case ruled that absolutely absolutely, Susan Clements Jeffrey does have a right to privacy. In fact, he said it's one thing to cause a stolen computer system to call back in an effort to get its IP address or track it down. It's something entirely different to violate federal wiretapping laws to do so. So what the judge ruled in this particular case was, even if Susan Clements Jeffrey got this computer system and this computer system was stolen, it is still the she still has a right to privacy and he also created this really bright line for us where he basically said clearly ip address and geolocation information and those two things are absolutely essential and it's going to be driving us forward over the next couple of slides um so now let's talk a little bit about some of the problems that we have with the perception of cyber deception and active countermeasures in the industry as a whole one of the problems that we have is we have a lot of people that are InfoSec thought leaders like Brian Krebs and Jeff Moss, who kind of poo poo the entire idea and ideals of active defense. They say, well, you should only do this if 99% of the other stuff is done correctly. It's just for the absolute elite organizations. Or they say no one's using it, so no one should use it. And I fundamentally believe that both of these views are actually pretty wrong. So if we look at previous Verizon data breach report data, where we can actually dive into how organizations detected they were compromised in the first place, we see some very disturbing trends. One of the problems that we see in these trends is the vast majority of the detects that organizations have for detecting the attacks in their organization actually don't come from their organization at all. It actually comes from external sources. And on this particular bar chart, which is a little bit hard to see, you'll see all the different DTECs on the left side and then how many of the organizations or what percentage detected their attacks using that technique. And if we dive into it, you quickly identify that about 67% of the DTECs and organizations came from external sources. That would be like the attacker posting the attack on GitHub or the or the the, uh, the artifacts of the attack and data on GitHub or a customer calling up and saying, I think you're compromised or law enforcement saying that you're compromised. This isn't good. And if you dive into things like endpoint security, it's about 4%. If you look at log analysis, it's about 1.4%. So even if we went back to what Brian Krebs said, and I hate to disagree with Brian Krebs, but even if we did everything right, it seems like the technology isn't 
quite working as well as we'd like it to. Now, that doesn't mean we throw away the technology, but it does mean that maybe we should recognize these weaknesses in the technology, and maybe, just maybe, we could start utilizing defensive techniques to start filling those various gaps that exist. And it turns out that MITRE, MITRE actually recognized this. Um, I've talked to a number of people with the MITRE SHIELD project, and MITRE SHIELD introduces the active defense framework for dealing with the MITRE attack technique matrix. And it includes things like robust network analysis with tools like RITA, where you can actually check and say, hey, is there beaconing happening in my environment? It has things like creating decoy content, decoy credentials, and decoy data to try to trick the attacker to use that data, interact with that account, go after those credentials for the purposes of trying to either attribute the attacker or detect them on their organization. Now, in the industry, there's not the industry, but in psychology and sociology, there's this really controversial theory of broken windows. And the idea of a broken windows theory is if, in a, if a bad person, a criminal goes into a neighborhood and they see lots of graffiti and broken windows, they think to themselves, this is a safe place to commit crime because there's evidence of crime all around them and everybody must be committing crime because it's still happening. So it'll increase crime if you have neighborhoods that are more run down. Now, once again, this is very controversial because of like, like racial profiling issues, social justice issues. How do you do this? It's very controversial, but it is kind of true. If you have somebody that thinks they're being watched or they believe that there's a higher risk, well, then there's probably a good chance they're not going to commit that crime. And this theory goes all the way back to like, Jerry Bantham and Panopticon and those things. So what we're talking about here is we're trying to increase not just the perceived risk, but the actual risk of an attacker trying to break into an organization to try to get it to that point where more attackers are like gonna think of other career choices, to be honest. So years ago, um, I actually kind of cut my teeth in the industry in computer security at Accenture and Anderson Consulting, and I moved over to classified work at Northrop Grumman. And since I've left the government, I've, I've had a clearance for a number of years, and I just want you to know, I've actually done cyber offensive operations for the government. And a lot of people are like, oh, hush, hush, cloak and dagger. I, I don't care. But the point is that I'm trying to drive is whenever you're doing cyber offensive operations for a government organization, the main rule that you have is don't get caught. And the reason why is generally getting shot in the face sucks. Also with that is if you burn a, an adversary that is at a nation state level, it makes it much more difficult to use that particular person moving forward. It also makes it more difficult if their techniques uh, their procedures and the different things that they use, the tools are burnt as well. So it's all about don't get caught. So they tend to be very risk adverse individuals. Now, organized crime is a completely different rule set associated with this, but trust me, they're also worried about getting caught as well. So if we dive in, where are we going to work? Well, we're gonna be spending a lot of time in this presentation talking about um, the uh, Canary tokens that come from Thinkist and her own Mir um, and Adrian and that team. Amazing resources that are built around detecting and getting attribution of bad people. So you can create you know, attributional documents, you can create attributional code in JavaScript to try to detect an adversary that's trying to clone your website. Tons of tools for free. And you can use their website or you can actually stand the code up in your own organization to do this type of detection as well. Now, if we tie this back to the MITRE SHIELD framework, well, it turns out this really kind of locks in to the decoy content side of the house. See, MITRE, they really focused on how we can actually create decoy files like PDFs and Word documents, create decoy code sets like JavaScript for cloned websites, to create decoy executables so that if an attacker interacts with those, it's going to be able to beacon back or set a tripwire for you to actually detect the attacker. Now, a key point with this, a very, very key point with this is if you're going out and you're going to hunt attackers, you have to be careful. 
Um, not necessarily like, oh, we're going to make them mad. I hate that argument. People are like, well, you don't want to do this because if we make the attackers mad, they're going to do bad things. That's stupid. If you're going to try to stop, like if we're going to try to pacify criminals by not angering them, we've lost. So let's get into the thing where we can actually get in the mud and start fighting and increase the overall risk to the adversaries. So if we're going to do that, I want you to think like a hunter. If you're going to hunt, you just don't walk around the forest with a bow and arrow and hoping that you see an elk. Instead, what you're going to do is you're going to watch the paths that animals take. You're going to set up game cameras to learn their patterns, which animals show up on what days, which mornings, where they're actually going to go. You're going to put yourself in the right location to increase your likelihood of success. That's literally what mountain lions do. They learn where deer go. They can actually tell how long ago a deer pooped in an area. They can see the path and they can sit and wait. That's what predators do. And that's what you need to do. We need to be able to set up our decoy content in the appropriate locations where an adversary is actually going to go. Now, there's a really cool distribution that we have created called the Active Defense Harbinger Distribution. This is a DARPA funded project where we brought a whole bunch of active defense, cyber deception and attributional technologies together and put it onto one virtual machine that you can actually download and you can use in your cyber deception and active defense environment in your organization. Um, so it makes it super easy. All of the instructions that are step by step by step and how to use them are built into this distribution. So it's very easy to actually work with. So let's start with some attack methodologies. Whenever an attacker is trying to break into an organization, one of the first things that they're going to do is they're going to do recon. They're going to try to find out as much about your organization as they possibly can before they launch an attack. So if we're thinking about this, like how would an attacker go about doing recon? They're going to try to enumerate users. They're going to try to enumerate, enumerate servers. They're going to try to use things like Shodan to identify those services on those servers. And they're going to try to identify if there's any like code repositories. Things like GitHub accounts associated with the people at your organization or associated with your organization. So how can we actually use that recon against an attacker? Now, the goal of this is we want to set up cyber deception someplace where it's not directly on your network. It's not like they have to hack into one of your IP addresses. It's someplace else that the attacker is going to feel safe pulling it from. Well, it turns out that the fine people at Thinkist have already thought of this, uh, play on words. And what they did is they created AWS S3 bucket tokens. Now, the way that this works is an attacker will be trolling GitHub associated with your company. So if you're looking at like Black Hills Information Security, we release tons of code to the public, right? We do pen testing, so there's pen testing code. We have defensive tools like Rita, so there's defensive code. So an attacker will find these code repositories in the hopes of trying to find credentials or files that whenever somebody did a Git pull or a Git, uh, like, a, like a request to update a GitHub repository, they accidentally may have uploaded some sensitive files that they shouldn't have. Happens all the time. So an attacker is going through and trying to find this. They see this S3 bucket credential. They get all kinds of excited. And then they start using a tool like S3 browser from Amazon to access that S3 bucket. And it doesn't work. Kind of a bummer, right? They put in the credentials. They tried to log in, tried to see the files that they have. And it comes back and it gives them an error. So you can make the sad trombone sound now. But on the back end, on the back end, Canary token actually triggered. As soon as they tried to access that particular file, or excuse me, they tried to access that S3 bucket, it actually recorded their source IP address and what tool they were using to try to access the S3 bucket. Once again, this is attributional. So now we have an alert and you can see the Canary token was triggered. And now we have a little bit more information that we can feed into our security team. Now, just doing geolocation based on IP address is a little bit problematic. We're going to talk about that in more detail here in just a few minutes. So just kind of sit tight. We'll, we'll deal with that problem here in a few moments. But this S3 bucket thing is huge. 
It happens literally all the time on the internet. You're constantly seeing articles where an S3 bucket was exposed and all these records were released to the internet. And a lot of times these are driven by pen testing companies that are trying to find these open repositories and then they quickly go to Wired um, or some other company and it becomes a news story and they're quoted and they use that as a way of trying to get publicity for being jackasses, I guess. I don't know, whatever, that's up to them. That's the way they do business, but yeah, that's weird. Um, and we've even seen this like in the previous week, there was a company that actually handled reservation data uh, for a lot of uh, hotels that was breached using this exact same technique. So yeah, that's somewhat of a problem. So this allows you to get an early warning that somebody is actively trolling through your code repositories and we may be lucky and get their IP address and get an idea of where they're actually from as well. Now, another technique that we can utilize, we can actually use straight up executables. Now, this is a bit strange because some people will say, how exactly do you get an attacker to just simply run a random executable? Well, you, once again, you gotta use the right bait. So maybe you would call your executable something like sysprep.exe or VPN config, but there's a number of different ways that you can actually trigger this and entice an adversary to actually download and run this particular executable. It's very, very, very powerful. Also, if we can create it as an executable, there's a number of tools like exe to VBA or exe to VBS and the Metasploit framework where we can convert any arbitrary executable into Visual Basic, at which point we can actually import it into a Word document or a spreadsheet as well. So pretty fun to do. So how would we do this with Canary Tokens? Well, you go to the Canary Tokens website, you choose your type of token as an executable, you give it an email address and a quick little message to notify that somebody ran it, and then you upload an executable and then Canary Tokens will actually insert a DNS tracker inside of that executable so you can see when it's fired. And I named mine in this example, Free Candy, and you can see that it actually beaconed back. But here's something fun. If you wanna start breaking away from Canary Tokens a little bit, you don't necessarily have to use their executable. I mean, it's great and it's really cool that they provide it, but there's other things that we can do where we can actually create real executables that do far more accurate geolocation. See, we can actually utilize different tools and techniques like VPNs who have these authentication scripts. Now, whenever somebody tries to run that particular VPN, it'll actually run a Python script, a PowerShell script, it can run an executable on their computer system. And security administrators and systems administrators run tools like this for the explicit purpose of doing things like checks of patches, checks of antivirus, checking a system to make sure it's safe to allow it onto the VPN. But here's the kicker. You can actually run a variety of different checks and some of those checks would have intense value from the perspective of attribution on an attacker. See, one of the checks that you can do is you can actually do a wireless survey from the computer system to see what wireless networks are nearby. You can run the command netshwlan show networks mode equals bssid. When you do that, it'll dump a list of all the wireless access points that are nearby, and then you can geolocate that particular attacker fairly quickly and easily. And this makes sense too, because we're doing location. So if we go back to Judge Rice, we're just getting location information or in a Word doc or uh, uh, executable, we're just getting an IP address. We aren't crossing that line and actually looking at the private data associated with an individual. So this becomes more powerful for us to actually do this as well. So that's, that's really cool. Now, where would you put this executable? Well, you would use things like robots.txt to specify different directories on your web infrastructure. And you would say, hey, Google, MSN bot, don't index these directories. Whatever you do, don't go there. And an attacker that's sitting on your box is gonna to totally look at these directories and go, oh, I'm going there. They're absolutely gonna to go to their directors, directories. So once again, we're using the hunting analogy. We're putting our trap in a place where the attacker is going to go, but a general user would never go. And that's absolutely essential to do this correctly. So 
The next one that you can do, whenever we're going down the attacker methodology, another thing attackers love is being able to clone web pages. Why do we clone web pages so much? Well, at Black Hills Information Security, one of the ways that we break into organizations is we'll find a website that asks for a user ID, password, maybe a two-factor authentication token. And we'll use tools like Evil Engine X or Modelishka um, or Cred King, Cred Sniper to try to take those credentials and use them to authenticate. But the first step of that is finding a website to clone because we'll clone that website We'll send that link into an employee at that organization, say, hey, click this link. You got to change your password immediately. And if you do, then you click the link and then I harvest your credentials, right? That's, that's pen testing 101, folks. So what you can do is you can insert this JavaScript. When you put this JavaScript on your website that requires user IDs and passwords, if the attacker comes in and clones that website, as soon as they clone that website and they run it on their server, it's going to beacon back and you're going to be able to get the IP address of the attacker before they send a single spear phishing email into your organization. And this works. We know this works because we use this all the time at Black Hills Information Security. Uh, so we have this set up. We have fake servers set up online. And if the attacker tries to access these fake servers, then we immediately get a notification that there's some shenanigans at play, that somebody's doing something that they absolutely shouldn't do. So this is one of our alerts back in 2019. Here's actually a list of a bunch of these different hits uh, against our server. And what we do with this is we take this data and then we put it into um, a, a deny list so our users can't even click the links to go to these different locations at all. Now, this gets into one of my pet peeves. This is threat intelligence. Threat intelligence isn't about purchasing a feed about an attack that happened against an organization a week or two weeks ago. Threat intelligence is basically pulling down what is attacking your network right now. And this is real time threat intelligence for an organization. Now, when we're looking at this as well, if we're gonna look at post-exploitation activities, one of the ways that attackers will handle their post-exploitation activities almost all the time is they'll get access to an environment and then they'll immediately start searching for Word documents on your environment that have like user IDs, passwords in those documents. And then they will open those documents in the hope of getting those sweet, sweet credentials in your organization. So once again, if we're hunting, we can actually take advantage of this. How? So what we can do is we can put Word documents on file servers in your environment in different shares, and we can name them like really descriptive names like passwords.docx or social security numbers.xls or creds.xlsx or doc, whatever. So what happens, an attacker gets in the environment, they enumerate the shares that they have access to, they immediately find a bunch of different files and services, and they go after those files, pull those files down and open them. Usually they open them on their own computer systems uh, that they're actually using to attack. And that has to do with GUIs and it's easier to pull it down and open on an attacker's computer system. So years ago, um, I was at DerbyCon and my brother was with me. And my brother is the uh, the main sales director of Black Hills Information Security. And whenever we travel to conferences, we stay in the same room. It's, 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 it's awesome. I get to hang out with my brother all the time. But I'm the older brother, so that means I get to torture him. So while we're at DerbyCon, I sent him an email. And I'm like, hey, dude, I sent you an email. I want you to open it. Now, this is at like 3 o'clock in the morning. So he tried to just kind of blow me off. And I'm like, dude, open the document. He's like, oh, I don't want to go back. I'm like, wake up, Brian, wake up. Open the document. And he's like, I don't want it. I don't want it. Finally, we get into a fight. There's banging. Things break. Hotel security shows up. They show up. They're like, what's going on? You guys fighting? I'm like, yeah, but we're brothers. They're like, cool, carry on. So I finally got him to the point where he opened the document. Now, when he opened the document, I got the IP address of where he was. Specifically, he opened the document while he was connected to the hotel wireless network. Once again, he wasn't VPNing or anything. It was all part of, I made him do it. I know it's wrong. I shouldn't, he shouldn't have used the hotel Wi-Fi, but I made him do it, right? So I got his IP address. Now, if we actually track that IP address, it actually put us in the middle 
of Louisville, Kentucky. Nowhere near where he was like at all. Like we're talking miles away. And this is usually the point where a bunch of people that are getting started in cyber deception will say things like, yeah, geolocation by IP address is crap. Like, how is this useful to me? I know the attackers in Louisville. Believe it or not, there's actually some value in that. But you're right. It's not the best it possibly could be. So it's it's somewhat problematic. But here's the deal. If you're looking at IP addresses, the way internet service providers work whenever they hand out IP addresses to their customers is they're usually handing out the IP addresses from a dynamic pool of IP addresses via DHCP, right? So we got dynamic host configuration protocol. And many ISPs aren't even gonna bother trying to geolocate where those are because they don't even know where they are. It's constantly changing, it's shifting. It's easier for them if they set it up that way. So why bother trying to track it? Now, the problem with this for an attacker is yeah, it says that they're in Louisville, Kentucky. But while many internet service providers are not really all that great at tracking the IP addresses they hand out to their customers, they tend to be much better at tracking IP addresses for their infrastructure and their routing infrastructure, for their routers and their switches and their backbone. So what we can do is we can run a trace route or a tracer T, if you will, to the IP address. So here on this slide, I did a full trace route back to my brother's IP address in the, in the hotel. And if you look, the very last IP address is his IP address of the, of the hotel that we were in. But if you go one IP address back, that's actually a router at a point of presence just outside of that hotel. Now, if we geolocate that IP address, it put us within half a block of where we were actually say, staying. And that's just good squishy. See, that's far more actionable and it's far more accurate and it's far more valuable than saying, eh, Louisville. Now I can say they're in Louisville, Kentucky and they're on this block. And that's really just super, super cool. So when you're doing this and you're trying to work with different documents, not all document viewers in Canary tokens are, are the canary tokens that you generate are going to work. So you really might have trouble with like Obby Word or LibreOffice possibly running on a Linux computer system. So that might be a little bit of, of a problem, right? So we actually have a tool inside of the Active Defense Harbinger distribution that is a lot better at actually doing attribution for those other word processors. What a lot of people don't know, and it's kind of a bit of a surprise, is that Microsoft Word is actually kind of a stripped down web browser. Um, it can support cascading style sheets for coming up with layouts of how data should be displayed on a page. And it can support image source tags on Word documents as well, which means we can load images from outside of the document into the document when the document opens up. And within Word web bugs on ADHD, um, you can actually specify the Word web bug server and it'll give a one pixel by one pixel image to that Word document when it opens. So you don't even see it. Also, the document opens and it looks just like a Word document. You don't put this HTML code inside of the Word document. You actually use like a low level editor like VI to edit that document, paste this in, and Word will just show you a straight white document that says what a buggy document. What's really cool about this though, is you can copy and paste pretty much whatever you want into the document. And then it's still going to beacon back and it's still going to call back. Now what works? Well, turns out there's a large number of different document editors that work really well. Obby Word will throw an error. It says, oh, well, this document's, this document's invalid, but it still reaches back. And when it reaches back, we get the IP address. Um, if you look at LibreOffice, we also have Apple Text Edit and then Microsoft Word, of course. So a lot of options available to you to actually get geolocation, putting these documents up throughout your infrastructure to try to find the adversaries as well. Now, there's some additional things you can look at when you're looking at how an attacker breaks into an organization. Once again, the predators are now becoming the prey. And the way that we can do that is we can also look at creating uh, fake user accounts on a domain that whenever somebody interacts with those user accounts, it actually helps us find where that user is. 
So how exactly would we do this? Now, there's products out there like Javelin, which was purchased by Symantec, where they can generate a bunch of fake user accounts. Many of those user accounts it used to be fairly easy to detect them because it set their last logon time to January 1st, 1601. I know the timestamp doesn't match January 1st, 1601, but that's epoch time, Greenwich Mean Time. So if you have a time shift on it, it's going to shift off of Greenwich Mean Time uh, to something different. So you can buy that. That's great. Or you can just do it for free. So what you can do to actually set this up in your environment, and, and this is one of my all-time favorite techniques, is you can create a number of different Honey accounts in your environment. Now, a couple of notes about this. One, you have to log into these accounts to update that epoch time. Um, so you need to do that right off the gate. The other thing that's kind of important is you can try to create the accounts so that it'll attract the attacker's attention. So like here you can create an account in this example, I called it um, Adam ADM Administrator. And uh, the attacker may see that and try to log in, possibly or not. I mean, it really doesn't matter. Most of the time when, when an attacker tries to move laterally in an environment, they simply will dump all of the user accounts, the net user space forward slash domain account, dump all of the users off the domain, and then try a single password against every single one of them indiscriminately. So they're not like looking through 100 accounts to try to find that one account. They're hitting them all. And we're going to be able to pick it up in either way. So if they see this and it's ADM administrator, they're like, all right, we're going after that account. Or they're just going to do a domain-wide password spray using a tool like Domain Password Spray from Dapt Hack to do it. So you'll create the account, you'll log into that account to update that epoch time for last login. Then you're gonna set the login hours to blank. And what this does is it basically means that this user account cannot log in at any time. Now this was created in Active Directory. If you had people that worked nine to five, you could set their login time to just be nine to five. And the thought was years ago, well, now an attacker can't break in at night and get their account. Kind of a weird thing, but whatever. So we can actually restrict login hours via Active Directory so that this particular account can never be logged in. This is a way for us to disable this account without disabling this account. Because many of the tools like Domain Password Spray are smart enough to look at these account um, accounts and avoid trying to log into accounts that are disabled, that are just simply sidestep them. So we want this account to be enabled, but we don't want the attacker to log into it. And two ways you can do that, create a really ridiculously long password the attacker would never guess, or creating login hours that are blanked out. Personally, shoot for both, right? Just try to lock that down. Now when the attacker logs in, you have an alert in your SIM that says anybody, any, anytime anyone tries to log in, as ADM administrator, you're able to actually detect them logging into that particular computer system. So that's just fun, right? And it's fun to have fun, but you have to know how. Now, we love whenever we're working with customers and they are able to detect us. One of the ways that they detect us, which is kind of cool, is they use the CRED Defense Toolkit. Now, the CRED Defense Toolkit was a tool that was created by a number of pen testers at Black Hills Information Security and released at DerbyCon. And one of the protections in the CRED Defense Toolkit was detecting Kerberosting style attacks in a domain. Now, let's explain what this is. So we talked about user accounts, right? In Active Directory, you can have service accounts as well. Here's the problem though. You can actually request a service principal name and a ticket associated with the service account without having like high level permissions. And when you get that ticket, inside that ticket is actually the password hash for that account. So you can basically reverse that and using something like Rubius to basically pull out a password hash and then try to authenticate to that account. So what you can do is you can create deception decoy service accounts. So now whenever the attacker tries to log into that as that service account, you can detect it and an alert can be generated. Now, this is amazing because when this works, it's something beautiful that we can put into our pen test reports where we can say that our customer was actually utilizing deception technology and it detected us. Now, my testers are a little bit less positive about this. Um, they don't like it as much as I do. A little bit 
less ambivalent than I am. Um, they tend to freak out and they're like, well, they're using deception and they caught me and that sucked. And I'm like, ooh, collect your tears and send them to me because pen tester tears make the best wine. So just a great way to try to detect them. The final tool I wanna to talk about is a tool called Honey Badger. Um, this was originally created by Tim Tomes and uh, Bradley at Black Hills Information Security has actually updated it and improved it in a number of different ways. And one of the cool things about Honey Badger is you can actually put geolocation tracking code inside of a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet. This makes it flexible. So now we're not just trying to get IP address information. Instead, we're trying to get very detailed geolocation information on where that attacker actually is. Now you can compile it easily, take that Visual Basic script, and you can run um, VBC for Mono, the Visual Basic compiler, to compile it down into an executable, and then you can convert it into a number of other different formats. How well does it work? Pretty darn well. This, once again, is from the last DerbyCon. We ran it, and it was able to geolocate right on top of the hotel, and it got us within 70 meters of where we were. In all actuality, it actually got the pin right on the part of the building in the middle where our conference was actually going. Um, once again, very, very powerful tool um, that you can set up. And you can get it here at github.com and you can pull it down from Bradley's GitHub repository. Now we've ran this in the past, a number of years ago, I ran an earlier version of Honey Badger at a large scary bank. We ran it there for two weeks and we were able to identify 250 different attackers on that environment. Out of this, we were able to find three or four, I can't remember, um, previously undisclosed and unknown compromised computer systems. Um, so very, very, very cool stuff that you can use everywhere. So another way that we can see how this works, uh, this came from Kent at Black Hills Information Security, and we tied together a number of different attack things, our threat intelligence from active and engaged defense. And we were able to say we've got targeted phishing coming from this particular IP address in the Netherlands. We were able to see that there was scanning coming from the Netherlands. We could see that they were actually hitting some of our honeypots. And I, this is weird. I went on Twitter and I said, whoever's trying to attack us from the Netherlands, please stop. We know exactly where you are. And I got a DM from a disposable account that basically asked, how the hell did you guys pick up on that? Once again, through the power of cyber deception. The final thing I'd like to talk about um, for this particular uh, category is a big part of MITRE also has in the SHIELD framework network monitoring and doing abnormal um, like network traffic analysis is part of what they're talking about. And this is huge because there's very few tools out there that are designed to actually help and aid an organization to detect anomalous traffic leaving their environment. And uh, we released a tool called RITA, that's Real Intelligence Threat Analytics for free to the community that anyone can download. Now, this particular tool's main claim to fame is being able to pick up beacons on a network that are leaving your environment. So it's very common to have command and control traffic that's beaconing out someplace else, and RITA is designed to pick that up. And yes, it can pick it up if somebody uses Jitter with Malleable C2 profiles, Yes, it can pick it up if somebody's using Google email, like GCAT to communicate. It's a very powerful tool. It also does long connection analysis, blacklist detection, um, DNS detection for DNS backdoors, user agent strings, and JAW 3 from Salesforce detection. So a lot of cool things baked into it. So once again, I wanna say thank you very much uh, for coming to this con. Um, it's absolutely cool, Security Weekly Unlocked. I'm hoping to see uh, Matt and Paul and the team just continue to grow and do amazing things for the community. And it's really cool to see this conference be a first step. So with that, thank you very much for your time today. And I hope you have a great rest of your conference. All right.